You're listening to Curated Consciously, your all-in-one platform for navigating and nurturing your conscious living journey. Why? Because diving into environmental justice comes with heartache and a lot of damn work. We gotta do it, but as a community, we can make the load a little lighter. Every week, we're bringing you stories, insight, and wisdom from a diverse community of leaders, activists, and influencers helping you live a more holistic lifestyle that connects your health, wellness, and love for Mama Earth. This podcast is sponsored by Cause Artists, the world's number one platform for social impact and innovation stories around the world. If you're looking to get inspired, hit us up at causeartists.com. And of course, I'm your host, Jasmine Rain, Curator-in-Chief at Curated Consciously and Social Entrepreneur. You can connect with me and our community on Instagram at Curated Consciously. Now roll your shoulders back, get comfy, put the coffee on. It is time to deep dive into some thought-evoking conversation, Curated Consciously. Kelsey, you have been home now for about four months um, after about four years of living in India. How is your heart? Mm. Well, thank you first off for the question. It's a good question. Um, One that I kind of tackle with on a daily basis, but I did have an epiphany recently. And uh, my epiphany was that I was really expecting to uh, be able to do this transition very smoothly. Um, And I've been beating myself up about feeling some grief, which you know me, I love me some grief. I'm, I'm all about, I'm all about being in the melancholy. I like a good cry. Um, grief is pretty much my best friend. Um, so for me to realize that I've been, uh, pushing that back and pushing that away, um, I, I felt, I felt bad for my friend grief. Um, and it was, it was a good reminder to, uh, to take a moment, um, and let myself feel a bit more. And so it's been, it has been hard. It has been unexpected. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, just to give a little backstory to our listeners here, I was meant to leave Delhi April 23rd, um, and go through this process of um, gradually making my way back to Canada Canada by way of Sweden and visiting my family there and stopping over the UK to see my friends and their new babies over there. Um, And then I was going to arrive in Canada on May 10th. And I also had, we had at at Jasmine's wedding and it was great, right? And, and we had moved out of, of Hada House and I kind of had about two months, I'd say, planned for goodbyes. And anyone who is close to me knows that um, I really, really value goodbyes, which I know also is another weird thing. Like people, people will be like, oh, I hate goodbyes. I am the opposite of that. I need my goodbyes. I need them to be intentional. I need them to be present. Um, So I had two months worth of goodbyes (laughs) planned out, uh, which included matching tattoos with Jasmine. Just saying. Yeah, I'm still really (laughs) bummed about that. I was thinking about it the other day. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to happen. It just didn't happen at the time that we were planning it. Um, And so I ended up, I had all of that kind of laid out beautifully, it included parties with different friendship circles, it included um, hikes and um, getaways and um, just time really. And I 
over the course of a week, we found that COVID was um, accelerating globally in uh, really kind of unprecedented ways. And I, uh, through the course of that week, ended up leaving India. And um, I was in tears the entire last day I spent uh, airport hopping is what I like to call it. Um, never quite sure if I was going to make it onto my next plane. Um, and just kind of uh, feeling an immense amount of loss and um, most of the time feeling like I wanted to turn back. Um, but that I was just gonna, you know, follow this path until it was closed to me. And I ended up getting on the last plane out of India before the lockdown happened um, and ended up being back, which was great for my family's uh, state of mind, which is part of what we're digging into. We're di I'm, I'm, that was a long-winded way of saying we are digging into what it feels like to come home from travel. And one of the big things is you deal with a lot of other people's opinions both uh both here and there and within yourself also kind of what my 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 title title page is gonna say yeah and thank you for sharing the um the backstory of like what's happened you know all the different parts of the stressful uh you know situation that you had to go through because um, coming home from travel or living abroad is already challenging just in that statement alone. But when you are forced to uh, remove yourself from a routine or you know a schedule that you've built to ensure that you've you know nurtured your heart and soul in you know leaving that destination and making sure that you've you've had some kind of touch point with all the people that you love, uh, when that's taken away from you, it is heartbreaking. And uh, I guess, honestly, I guess I kind of experienced something similar when I first came home from India after like a year and a bit in 2016. Yeah. And that was uh, due to a health issue. Um, and yeah. that was, uh, I, I remember, uh, honestly, like I, I definitely, I don't want to make this episode um, about my story, uh, but just in general, like the, the challenges that I faced um, were, you know, a lot of very similar things that you'll, you'll be just, you'll be talking about too today. And, you know, one of them was like, I don't feel at home when I got home. I was like, I don't, I don't know what home is now. Like I feel so much more comfortable uh, in, in, you know, my little village in India and like the, the community that I built and feeling so disconnected and feeling like I could not hold a conversation with anybody and that I was constantly mm -hmm. in tears. And actually at the time I was in a long distance relationship, but um, uh, with someone in Canada. So like I was basically in India for like the first full year, uh, the first year of our relationship. And, you know, and it was so weird when I came home and was like, oh my gosh, like, am I in the right relationship? Like, am I supposed to, like, you know, does this person support me, even though I'm just like crying my eyes out every day because I want to be in India. And then like navigating, getting a job again and like trying to restart and rebuild when you've sold everything. Um, I know that's a, a little bit different for you, obviously, because you have your amazing Hidden Springs retreat and home base there. But, you know, you know, speaking of, home bases, you know, like when you, now that you're home, you know, how do you kind of navigate the concept of like, what is home? Are you the type of person who's like, yeah. uh, you know, I have two homes, like home is Canada, home is India, or, you know, is a home kind of this concept that's like, okay, I can't navigate this. Like, this is too complicated. Like, I don't know how to define what home is uh, because it can be different for everyone. So mm -hmm. which approach do you take, Kelsey? <laughs> I mean, I completely agree with everything that you just said. Um, for me, <laughs> I find it depends on who I'm talking to a lot of the time. Um, and what I realized is that a lot of people who are in Canada don't really know, of course, because everyone has their own lives, they don't really know uh, what 
what my life consisted of in India. And so if I am talking to someone over here about my journey, I say, um, coming back to Alberta or coming back here. Um, I really intentional about using those kinds of phrases um, because it helps just in very small ways to reinforce in their mind how important India has been and remains to me. Um, and then usually in that conversation, um, I'll, I'll bring it around by saying, well, in being in India, living in India is going to be a part of my life for the rest of my life as, as much as I can foresee it. Um, and so I'm really hesitant. I only use the word home with my people who feel like home. Um, and the people who understand that, yeah, like the people who understand that I have pieces of myself that have grown and rooted in different places and different geographical places, as well as with different people. Um, and you, you brought up the long distance relationship. I, I mean, he would hate me for talking about it, so I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, but I have a partner in India um, at the moment, and we continue to talk about doing our life together and don't really know what that looks like at the moment because we can't physically be in the same place with each other. And um, so it has been a, a journey in long distance relationships with me, which neither of us were really keen on. Um, like, like ask me a year ago if I would have voluntarily walked into a long distance relationship and I would have like slammed the door in your face. <laughs> <laughs> um because because it it just seems like such a a ridiculous endeavor um but when when the date got closer and closer we started to have to talk about it um and ended up um intentionally choosing that that breaking up wasn't worth it. Like if the hardest thing that we have to go through is live across the world from each other for an extended and unknown amount of time, then that's fine. Like we can do that. Um, and so far it's been actually surprisingly easy. Um, and both of us kind of said, well, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how well, you know, talking over text can have miscommunications or um, not having not having communication um, can be an issue. And and so far, neither of those have been issues. And so I feel extremely lucky because I know that that's not the case with a lot of long distance relationships. There's a lot of heartache and um, kind of uncertainty with roles and uh for us it's been so far so good so we'll see how we go <laughs> well you know i also feel like um let's call let's call them n you know i feel like n <laughs> um is also you know also familiar with you know the back and forth of travel having lived in um where was it living again uh, oh, we keep it anonymous. Far away, live far abroad. Far away, far. N was living far away abroad. Yeah, sorry, I'm not very good at the anonymous thing, obviously. <laughs> 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 but you know, um, them having a uh, an understanding of kind of like having to disconnect and having to reconnect. Also, uh, knowing them and knowing that they are not really the reconnecting person. <laughs> Um, 
Like, it, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it, it's also great to have somebody who kind of understands that transition, supporting you through it and like knowing kind of, you know, not necessarily knowing exactly what you're going through, but is, but is there to like recognize the symptoms and the challenges. And of course, to have a community of people like, you know, me and, you know, various of other amazing human friends that are, I mean, and alien friends, I'm sure we have a few alien friends, um, that understand that transition. I feel like, you know, we, we're definitely, what's, what's funny actually is like thinking about, um, you know, four years ago when I was coming home from travel, I didn't have anybody who understood what that felt like, except maybe like my mother. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so, and, and maybe, and, and one of my, you know, childhood best friends who, who lived in, um, who was studying abroad in Ghana for a few years, um, you know, that transition home, you know, everyone is asking questions like, you know, um, well, first they want to ask about, like, if you are in a relationship, they want to know everything. And they're like, oh my gosh, how are you going to do it? Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're going to be long distance. Like, how are you going to make it work? And it's just like, okay, first of all, that is like not supportive language whatsoever. So I think maybe we need to cover like language <laughs> for like how to like talk to people who are going through that. And then second is also like people wanting to ask you questions like, oh my gosh, how was your trip? Or like, how was your time abroad? Or like, how was India? Like these very generic questions that don't lead mm -hmm. to any kind of, it doesn't even welcome conversation because it's so superficial. Um, it's like asking people like, how are you? When you know, you're not, you're just expecting everyone to give you an answer like, I'm fine. You know, so I remember, I remember I would start conversations. People would ask me like, how was India? And I'd be like, okay, well, like I'd ask, do you really want to know? And they'd be like, yeah, of course I want to know. And yeah. then I would like go into this kind of, um, you know, story framework that I built in my head, like on the way home, <laughs> because I wanted to be able to navigate these conversations in a way that wasn't superficial, in a way that actually gave them insight into what I'd been doing here. And like 10 for 10 almost, every time that conversation started, uh, it usually ended quite quickly because they would, their eyes would glaze over, they would be distracted, you know, they weren't prepared for a half an hour to one hour conversation with me. And, and I shouldn't say that for like everybody, you know, I, I definitely have friends that like put aside time and stuff. But, you know, that was also very challenging for my mental health because like I could only reflect on my experiences alone and I wasn't able to like have kind of my support system help me with that transition because nobody was really prepared to hear uh of you know what i'd experienced and the impact of the work i was doing and you know you know talking about the challenges that i'd faced individually as well as with it like as a community and you know i'm curious in in coming home what has that been like for you how have you been able to navigate um you know the mental challenges uh, mental health challenges that do come up and the transition to reconnect with your community. Yeah, so the biggest one for me, thank you for sharing yours, by the way. So challenging, that conversation. Oh my goodness. I think I I typically um, start with the smallest answer first. And if they ask me another question, then I'll, I'll give them a bit of a longer answer. And, yeah. you know, never, <laughs> That's also a never give them too much. <laughs> But for me, um, one of one of the biggest challenges, and I kind of hinted at it earlier, was that or had or is is um, that coming back to Alberta and taking like moving back into my childhood home, taking over management of this farm and this property and this business um, has always been the goal. Um, and has always been something that I've been aiming for. And um, spe I specifically tailored my time in India to equipping me with the um, skills that I would need to, in order to come back and um, implement and pursue that goal. And, and so I came back here early but I was still, you know, the, the, the comment that I would get all the time, um, or even still is, oh, you were planning to come back anyway. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, 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 sure. I was 
planning to come back anyway. I wanted to come back. I, it's, it's been an aim. And so if this is something that I've wanted, if this is, if, if I am living the exact story, almost the exact story of what I set out to live, then I can't be complaining about it. Then I should know how to do it. So then I should be able to make this transition completely fine without that grief. Um, I, I should be able, you know, all of these expectations that I really um, kind of unknowingly actually, but sort of we, we know, but we don't know at the same time, um, put on myself. I put on these really kind of harsh expectations and, for months of being back, I would just, I, I mean, Jasmine, you heard me when I would be talking to you. I'd, I'd say, I, can, I can't get anything done in a day. I have a list. My list is as long as my arm, and I feel like I'm not checking anything off. I'm not able to, you know, engage with the work as efficiently. I'm not able to fix things as well. I need, I, there is information here that I don't have. It actually took me going back to counseling. I haven't been in counseling for since 2015. Um, I, value, I value the self-care of talking to another person, but, but the thing that was happening with me is I would be experiencing the failure of meeting these expectations. I would be talking it through with my partner and my family and my friends. And then and we would come up with coping mechanisms or strategies or, you know, write down one thing that you're grateful for every day or post something, you know, all of those strategies. And it still didn't connect for me into changing that expectation and so i knew that i wasn't able to implement that none of these typical things of, and talking with my support system wasn't working and so it actually took going to a third party therapist who was trained to deal with these things um for that that person to get me to look at what the situation is and and just asked me he just asked me well what are the expectations that you've been putting on yourself and i'm not lying to you it felt like a weight had been lifted off of me because in in whatever ways i've been talking about it with my friends and my family and my partner, I didn't see it that way. Um, and, and, and I talked with my mother a lot about collaboration and getting help for tasks and asking people for advice or, you know, it, or like learning from her experience and, and all of those, all of those little things that, that would have helped with the expectation. But because I wasn't, critically looking at that as an expectation that I was holding for myself, I would dismiss getting someone in to help me clean the guest house, or I would dismiss calling up my uncle to get him to come teach me how to fix fences, these kinds of things. Um, and so when I was able to make the connection um, between you know, what I had been expecting myself to be able to achieve. Then I was able to say, oh, well, asking for help doesn't mean that I am failing at this dream that I've been striving for for the last four years. And of course, I knew that already intellectually, um, but it just, it hadn't been connecting. And so um, I knew that, I knew that one of my coping mechanisms that helps me is talking to 
a therapist or a counselor or a mentor. Um, and, and I have a session with them tomorrow, actually, um, because it's just a, a self care thing that, that I can rely on. Um, and what that does, if I am taking care of that for myself, then, then my connections with my communities and reconnecting with my communities can be done without that baggage then, right? And so I can take on advice from my mother without it meaning that I am inadequate. Um, and I, and I really was very mindful before moving back that, um, I didn't want to slip into a role that I had had previously and that I wanted to be able to establish who I am and what I am doing. And that turned into, instead of that doing, you know, being mindful and intentional, it turned very rigid which um which meant that i you know for the first while wasn't even open to asking for help at all um which is just insane because we all need help all the time and that's really powerful just to like what i'm hearing here is that like by accessing support outside of your circle um it, it makes it a little bit easier to transition because then you don't feel like you are almost dismissing what people uh, like what your community is trying to communicate to you um mm -hmm. and you know i can definitely relate to that i feel like i still get very sensitive um well you know i'm still living abroad but you know now you know now india really is home like i have a family here and um and I still struggle with hearing people kind of like question, not necessarily like what I'm up to, but just like India or different aspects of like traveling and living abroad. And, you know, um, I'm sure we've both faced enough conversations in regards to like people giving their opinion that's so based on like a stereotype or, or you know, uh, based on just wanting to have an opinion. <laughs> Um, like not even having, not having experienced anything relevant to what, you know, someone might be going through after transitioning back to, um, you know, in quotations home. But, you know, um, as you're moving forward, like it's been, it's been four months. So I'm, I'm curious, like, and, you know, and you're starting to take on new projects. You're about to start an incredible new program next week. You know, do you think um, that, you know, activity has, you know, activity and, you know, having something to look forward to has helped in your process? Mm. Um, very interesting question. I'm not sure. Uh, and I will say that um, the only reason that I'm hesitating is that this work week this week right now that we're recording this has been the busiest week of my life since the week of your wedding jasmine oh goodness <laughs> that definitely is a busy week <laughs> i mean i mean and if i've had however many glorious months of not having that kind of schedule and one thing that i've learned from covid um is that i've really enjoyed um not having a busy schedule and that's a very interesting comparison to when i would come back to alberta in the past because when i would come back to alberta in the past it would be for a couple weeks or a month at a time and it would be very much like a visit which was the strange thing visiting a place that has been or was or is your home is such a strange sensation um but in that visiting time uh i would be 
going to family events and visiting friends and driving to Edmonton and driving to Calgary and spending a night at this friend and just spreading myself so thin. So for the first time in years, almost uh, like this week, I have felt that pressure and I realized I hate it. <laughs> I feel you on that. Like, that's another thing that I, I think we've both talked about this actually before you left. You know, I was saying like, Remember, even if there's a million and one things that you want to do and there's a million and one things that need to get done, it's so important that you nurture yourself first uh, before you jump in. Um, you know, taking yeah. the time to breathe and reflect and absorb everything. I mean, obviously, it's very, like, you know, it'll take your whole life to absorb four years in India. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like taking an intentional, <laughs> an intentional yeah. moment to, yeah, to, to take in, you know, just the fact that you, you've done something and, you know, you went somewhere that was amazing. You did amazing things. And, you know, now it's time to, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to say go a different direction because that's not what's happening because you'll definitely be back and it's not likely you're going anywhere, but, you know, it, sometimes it feels, um, it, it just, just like, COVID leaves us so uncertain. I feel like coming home from travel leaves us uncertain. And when you mix the two together, you get a lot of uncertainty. <laughs> um. It's definitely shifting gears. Like yes. that's what it feels like. And sometimes you get the clutch wrong. And <laughs> yep. Yep. And I don't drive standard, so I would not be able uh -oh. to navigate. <laughs> Um, but something that I really wanted to mention is, um, I actually, I just remembered, I wrote an article back in 2016 when I did come home, um, oh. for, for the She's Wonderful platform, which is a women in travel platform. Absolutely incredible. I love them. I've been a member of their organization for, I want to say organization, their community for a really long time. Um, but I wrote an article called post-travel depression. Here's what you can do. Um, because I do think that post-travel depression is something that it does exist. I think it's a great way to, I mean, I know using the, the word depression can be, um, really heavy, but you know, there is this sense of just so much uncertainty and so much sorrow and disconnect, um, and the need to be alone and, but also needing to have community during that time to help you kind of transition. Um, so I did an article, I wrote an article about it. And one of the things that I, and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes, but one of the things I remember when I got home, I was struggling so much to like find things that made me happy, uh, which it sounds mm -hmm. awful, but I was, I was really struggling to find things that made me happy. And um, that's actually the time where so my mother had just moved downtown Toronto. What I remember we went on this walk and we ended up discovering this, uh, this um, aerial circus studio and like aerial art studio. And me and my mom just like randomly signed up for a free trial class. And, you know, fast forward four years later, you know, Ariel Silks and Hoop has been a massive part of my, my, my life from, you know, nurturing my mental health, my physical health, my artistic and performance needs, cultivating community with people who um, love the arts. And also, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of, um, uh, aerial members that I, that I came across in, in that time. I was also on the performance team for a year and a bit, you know, we're all avid travelers as well because they were like traveling aerialists. And, you know, one of those amazing individuals uh, who was actually a coach at the time uh, was Brittany, who uh, also happened to become a Hot World intern uh, for three months earlier this year. So it's so amazing. Uh, you, you never really know, um, you know, uh, just in general, you never really know what's going to happen to the people that you're going to meet and all the ways your lives will cross. Um, but, you know, finding, you know, I, because I couldn't really find connection with my immediate community, um, it didn't even realize that what I actually needed was to, you know, learn a new skill to kind of get myself out of my head, um, reconnect right. with a community at home, and then also you know, be able to connect with people who kind of understood what I was going through. And I was able to find that through my aerial community. Um, so I, that's something that I, 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 I've thought of often uh, over the last couple of years, but I've never really connected it back. So I'm glad I got to kind of bring that up now, but, you know, finding a new skill yeah. and finding a community that understood what I, what was, what I was going through um, really, really helped me kind of manage that transition. 
where we go when we're when we're traveling, whether it becomes uh, a home or if it's just something that we're passing through, it is um, endlessly transformative. And what I think that a lot of people who don't travel very much don't quite understand is that it's not separate from quote unquote real life. It's not like it's a vacation that is a pause on everything else. It is, um, if we're doing the traveling that, uh, that we like to talk about um, and that we like to participate in, um, then that sort of travel is foundational and a, a structural part of our personhood and the way that we walk through the world. I truly believe that. Mm -hmm. Snaps to that. Snaps to that, Kel. I did say I was going to cut us off at 11.45 and I forgot because I got too into the conversation. <laughs> because I'm trying to make these episodes like easy bite-sized pieces, but um, I get so excited in the topics and in chatting that I lose track of time. So I want to respect both of our time, especially because you are uh, in the wee hours of the morning almost now and um, have a busy day ahead of you as you get ready and prep off for programs. So Kelsey, just want to say thank you again for joining me for another, another episode. Um, and I know that we'll have like six more in the near future. This is just the beginning. Awesome. Well, no, thank you again. Thank you for getting vulnerable. Thank you for sharing your story, your experiences, and you know, what has, what has worked for you uh, during this time. And hopefully our listeners who are experiencing something similar, especially if they were kind of like pushed into a decision as COVID, um, you know, uh, took over. Because I feel like that's definitely a position that many people were put in. I hope that you found this episode helpful. And it, again, if you want to reach out to us to dive deeper into this topic, hit us up, hit us up. Hello at curatedconsciously.co or on Instagram at curatedconsciously. Um, and yeah, me and Kels will be back with you soon. And we've got a ton of other episodes lined up uh, with amazing other individuals that are part of both our communities as well as greater community around the world. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening. Inhale the goodness, exhale the bullshit. Thank you for listening. And thank you for doing the work. Be sure to jump over to curatedconsciously.co for more stories, tips, and inspiration for nurturing your conscious living journey. And be sure to follow along on Instagram at curatedconsciously. Huge shout out to my incredible husband, Profound Sound, for the original dope tracks. Hope you all enjoyed, are feeling a little lighter, and are going into a beautiful and blessed day.